everybody. It's a great pleasure to introduce and welcome Mike Rosser to our seminar today. The reason, or one reason perhaps, why we are all together <coughs> is because the topic of understanding the origin of life is, of course, one that is at the heart of uh, everybody's um, desires. Uh, and it is a problem that is being approached from so many different directions. And the direction that we are trying to understand here today is through the geochemical uh, understanding of the origin of life. Mike uh, Russell has been doing a significant amount of work in this field and has been uh, gradually getting uh, more and more exposed to the, to the problem and has been making <coughs> understanding uh, really a fairly coherent story which is bringing us from the very beginning to the question of uh, where we can, how we can understand the origin of life. Uh, Mike did his PhD at the uh, University of Strathclyde in uh, 73 and uh, that was, uh, and he continued it as a, as a reader and got later promoted as a full professor in 83, uh, moved then to Glasgow in 1990, and has been there until 2005, which is when he moved to JPL, California, where he is holding the position as distinguished visiting professor. He has a Yes, that's, that's really all I need to say, I think, at this point. <laughs> and, uh, and, that's, and we had uh, some of us, uh, actually it's, I think it's a small amount of us, uh, who have uh, heard him speaking yesterday in the geology department, the uh, geochemistry department. Uh, today we have an opportunity to hear uh, the, the story from a somewhat different perspective, but we hopefully have the opportunity to ask him questions because uh, Mike is clearly talking to an audience which is uh, not necessarily too familiar with all the uh, geochemical uh, uh, expressions that we are going to hear. So if there are any such issues, Mike will be happy to, uh, to be interrupted and, uh, and answer such questions. Mike, please. Thank you very much. Thanks. So, yes, yesterday was a talk or a lecture. Today is kind of being a seminar, so we can interact. And uh, we, I'm not sure how far we'll get through it, of course. And once, if you get bored at any time, but especially at four o'clock, you're welcome to leave. Uh, and, but if other people want to keep talking, as it seems that some people do, <coughs> I've been talking all day so far, uh, and I hope I'm going to hold up, but, you know, please, whatever. Anyway, the emergence of life. What, what would a cosmologist, or what do cosmologists and astronomers say about the origin of life? Well, it's easy, because all you have to do is you point out the telescope, and up there, spectroscopically, you can find glycine in, uh, in space. Uh, so, of course, that's the first amino acid, and I mean, what's the problem? So, but uh, the, the assumption underlying that is that life is, uh, is merely the organization of organic molecules that already exist in the cosmos. And I'm going to say that that's absolutely wrong. Uh, so, just to start, I don't want to ask what life is. I want to ask what life does. I mean, you, you know, that's, that's always the proper question because if you just ask what something is, you'll never understand it. You won't have empathy for it. You can think of all kinds of systems where nobody bothered to ask what something did and they asked what something was and they misunderstood the system. So what is, why does life start? Well, it starts to resolve the chemical and uh, electrochemical uh, tension on a planet between its interior which is generally electron rich, and its exterior, which is generally electron poor. And the way this, what we're looking at is life is the discharge, at least the, at the emergence of life, was where that energy was discharged. And that energy, of course, only amounts to about 500 millivolts, up to perhaps a volt. So that's the kind of energetics we're looking at. We're not looking at lightning, we're not looking at UV light at all. We're looking at something that's absolutely commensurate with the way uh, bacteria work. So this is a complicated diagram. It's not supposed to, it's just supposed to announce the talk, really. But uh, anybody can have this. Uh, if anybody wants this, it's freely available, uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, so I'm not going to go into this, but we might return to this picture. 
So, so we've talked about what, why does life start? What does life do? Life hydrogenates carbon dioxide. That's what it does. Hydrogen plus carbon dioxide makes a small but ever continuous amount of organic molecules. That's life's job. Just think about it. Looking out the window, there's the tree. What's it doing? It's taking hydrogen from water and reacting with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and making organic molecules. It's using metals, of course, as cath catalysts, but that's what it really does. So where will it be? Well, it'll be on any sunny, wet, rocky planet that's large enough, massive enough, to hold a carbon dioxide atmosphere. So presumably there was life on Venus at some time before a, a particular type of global warming took care of getting rid of the water. And of course, it's very likely to have been on Mars, at least to start with, and probably is still there now, although it's going to be a detection limit problem to, to discover it. But uh, Mars also, all these, all these planets had a carbon dioxide atmosphere, always. So let's... And I'm sure I will have some sim oh sorry. <laughs> I thought I recognized it. Okay, so here's uh this is the so we're astrobiologists. I mean that's for a thought, that's for a while just be astrobiologists. And that's a peculiar term, isn't it? But so we go back four billion years, a third of the age of the universe. We know we're not looking at the same planet. You know, it's uh, important to recognize that. So it's a water world. And, and by the way, any... Why you need, you need water? Well, it's not a question why you need water. You've got water. Okay. So, it's, okay. uh, so the, the amount of water on the planet is about 10... To, what's it? About 2 times 10 to the 24 grams. It's a pathetically small amount. You know, when you fly at 10 kilometers, you have to imagine the ocean's only 5 kilometers deep. I mean, it's a very tiny amount of water. It was probably, uh, according to the Potsdam group, there was probably twice as much water on the planet four billion years ago. Uh, so, which means that there were no, there might have been continents, but they were not, uh, there was no land. Uh, so the, you can think of it in lots of different ways, but probably the water was too deep. But anyway, the, the earth was so hot that you couldn't keep uh, structures above sea water anyway. I mean, even today, it's 70% water. The planet. But then it was almost entirely, probably always, all water. And it was tempestuous. It would, the day lasted four or five hours. There was nothing to stop the hurricanes. Nothing. It just was really appalling weather conditions. Uh, with, of course, plenty of lightning wherever you looked, continual lightning, and of course, bomb, bombardment from uh, uh, meteorites. And of course, hard UV coming in at eight times the present uh, uh, flux. So, it, so in other words, it's a pretty unpleasant place on the surface as far as a human uh, consideration. There were tiny amounts probably of methane and ammonia, but not much. Uh, it was mostly carbon dioxide and no land, therefore no Darwin's little pond. There's no warm little pond. So one of my pleas, and I think I'm in the right place for this kind of plea, and that is that we've got to get the initial physics right. We've got to get the initial conditions right. Unfortunately, in the origin of life, most people have never worried about the initial conditions. They, they've been more immediate. They've wanted to have, how do we make things from a chemical point of view? And you can't do that. It's what the world gives you that we've got to consider. So one of the points about the initial conditions is it was a very rough universe, uh, very, sorry, very rough uh, surface of the planet. And of course, the, the way the planet gets rid of its heat is through convection. And one, one, of the, one of the things I would like to get across is that there's convection in the core, of course, and we know that's what gives us the, uh, our protection from cosmic radiation. Uh, there's convection in the mantle, which gives us plate tectonics. Uh, convection, hydrothermal convection gives us hot springs. Convection in the oceans and uh, convection in the atmosphere. And of course, eventually, uh, heat is radiated to space. But convection is absolutely significant. It's the way the Earth mostly gets rid of its heat, internal heat. And there's a paradox about this from a, from a chemical point of view, and that is it's the very convection that actually places uh, chemistry in the lurch. It, it adds to chemical tension. And metabol what I'll say to you is that metabolism is the kind of, uh, it's the answer to convection, if you like. So metabolism and convection are coupled. In fact, if you think about it today, if you didn't have convection on the planet, you wouldn't have life anyway. So philosophically, it's easiest for us to see that, that, that life very likely started 
actually related very closely and closely coupled to convention. So, we know it's a kind of reduced, if you'd like to put it crude, can anybody see this or is it too big that to try? Sure? Okay, so, uh, so the, the Earth is, if you like, it's kind of electron rich. Uh, it's, it's got, I mean, the key element is, is fer ferric iron, uh, is iron. Uh, ferrous iron for the most part, Fe2 plus, and a little bit of native iron probably. Uh, and because of this native iron uh, and uh, ferrous iron, uh, there tends to be a generation of hydrogen from the Earth. Okay, so, and, and the hydrogen is coming from water. It's the hydrogen, and I'll explain that again. But basically, the electrons are added to water, the iron is oxidized, and hydrogen is released. But, and that's at low temperature, but at high temperature, the gas that's evolved from the Earth is mostly carbon dioxide, hence the carbon dioxide atmosphere. If you put all the carbonate rocks and all the limestone, all the oil, all the coal back into the atmosphere, you've probably got 70 or 80 atmospheres of carbon dioxide on this planet. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there was at any point <coughs> 70 or 80 atmospheres like Venus. But uh, nevertheless, one can certainly imagine anywhere between 10 atmospheres uh, to one atmosphere of carbon dioxide. And now we've got about 300 parts per million, or what is it, 350 parts per million, 370 parts per million, sorry, I'm rising, of course. Uh, but what volcanoes give us is carbon dioxide, oxidized species, some sulfur, sulfur dioxide, nitric oxide, and some phosphate. So this is the, this is the output of volcanoes to this day. Uh, and of course, there were probably between 10 and 100 times as many volcanoes on the early Earth because it was such a hot place. Uh, and volcanoes is one way of distributing the heat. <laughs> it's, it's got, like, when you show this, it's going to look like I'm crazy. I'm doing this kind of thing in front of there. <laughs> So the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. The ocean, therefore, is carbonated water. It's just like Pepsi Cola, without the flavor. Uh, <laughs> pH 5.5. <laughs> so that's very significant, I think. So it's rather like a bacterium, okay? So I mean, an autotroph means a bacterium that lives off very simple molecules like carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So it's rather like it's rather like an autotroph, and the reason why it's like an autotroph, particularly, is because, as we know, and I'm sure you all know, uh, you can get methane evolving from planets like this. And indeed, you probably saw a paper in Nature, I think it was last early this year, by Mike Moomer, and there's been other papers on methane coming out of Mars. And so, methane is supposedly in the atmosphere of Mars. And of course, the question is, is it biological methane or is it not? And it's a good question because we don't, simply can't tell and don't know. But it's rather like a methanogen. That is a bacterium or an archaeobacterium that generates methane or methane. And so here's a methanogen. So what a methanogen can live off is carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So it's rather like the whole planet. Uh, I mean, I, I, somebody talked about fractals earlier on. But, but uh, I mean, I'm not exactly a fractal, but on the other hand, you can see a similarity. Or you can think of it as an electrochemical cell uh, with an output of something like half to one volt. So could it be that life just kind of bubbled off from the surface of the planet? Could we think of it like that? That we've got a kind of little bubble, a membranous bubble that bubbles off and does the same job as the planet, but does it a lot better. In other words, uh, something that's maximizing entropy production on the planet. So we can imagine it like this. Here's a little bubble. Let's imagine this is the surface of the planet below the sea. So we're on the solid surface. And we can imagine something bubbling off like this. And what do we find inside it? Well, we find hydrogen, because there's plenty of uh, hydrogen coming in from the, the planet. Uh, it's got it's alkaline. In other words, there's very few protons. Uh, it's an alkaline phase. And, and it comes into an ocean that's acidic. Uh, it's got plenty, it's high protons, uh, and it's got carbon dioxide in it, you know, so in other words, it's carbonic acid. Uh, and the significance of this is that the protons on the outside, uh, and there's no protons here, so you've got an extremely high proton gradient coming through this membrane. And that's just like life. Life, all life lives off of, especially a proton gradient. 
it, it lives off redox reactions, reduction oxidation reactions, and a proton gradient. So one of the things surely about the emergence of life must be that it was simple and everything was in the right place, all well focused, very low entropy system, and so life could emerge. We don't want to think in any kind of contingency. We don't want to say, well, we're going to need some glycine from space and stuff like that. Everything's got to happen on site in this one place. So here's the bacterium. And here, what a bacterium does to make the proton graded is it drives protons out of the, out of the uh, bacterium so that they're on the outside. And then they can come back and generate uh, and be used to generate energy. For example, adenosine triphosphate, ATP, which you make your body weight of every day. And that, the way you, your body makes it is through a proton gradient. And that's what energizes you, the adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. So if we look, go back to the overall planet, where this water world, then the main reaction that's happening is hydrogen plus CO2 gives you methane plus water. Okay? And it, it does it slowly, but it does it it doesn't. Another possible reaction, which wouldn't, doesn't go so far, and looks at first sight more complicated, well, it's a bit more complicated, hydrogen plus CO2 doesn't quite get the methane, but actually makes something called acetate, or acetic acid, or vinegar. Uh, and this is different in the sense it's got a carbon-carbon bond, but actually it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, much more difficult to make acetate for the world. The world hardly makes any acetate without the help of life. But there's something in the wing. So there's two possible reactions, I would say, that will be there right at the beginning of the Earth, uh, which could be exploited if, back, if the first life could uh, compete with, the way, with geochemistry, if you like. So I've said that these reactions can be quickened to life. And uh, so it, it's uh, using the Germanic sense of the word quick. Uh, lively, enlivened. These reactions can be enlivened. They can be quickened. Um, they can be made more rapid uh, by life. But where would this happen? Well, when I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard of black smokers and the very hot springs at the, the, the mid oceanic ridge. This is a mid oceanic ridge being separated here because of the mantle, the hot mantle upright rising about 1500 degrees centigrade. And we know that water comes down in towards the magma, it gets heated to its critical point, gets extraordinarily buoyant, and comes straight back to the surface, loses a bit of heat on adiabatically, comes back about 400, 360 to 400 degrees centigrade, bringing iron, zinc, nickel, cobalt, and so forth to the surface, to the ocean floor. And when uh, this was first discovered by people like Jack Corliss, they immediately, of course, thought, well, because these springs are so beautifully exciting in terms of finding a, a kind of alien life form, they thought that maybe life started here at, at these systems. You know, here's a nice crab, for example. There's often fish here. There's all these tube worms. Uh, so life seems pretty happy here. Uh, but let me just say that obviously they're way too hot. This is much hotter than any oven you might use. They're too acidic. They're too oxidized. They're too spasmodic uh, for emergent life. But they do provide trace elements to the ocean. And on the early ocean, in the early ocean, there wouldn't have been these black smokers. There would have been these hot springs, but the black smoke is because of the titration of alkaline seawater, the acidic, uh, acidic waters, and so that you get a precipitation, around about neutral, of these uh, iron sulfides, ma magne uh, manganese, uh, magnesium oxide, uh, mag manganese oxides, and so on. But in the earlier, an acidic spring would have come into an acidic ocean, and you had these metals supersaturated. So you would have had a reservoir of trace elements, such as, uh, well, let's think about them, iron, nickel, manganese, copper, uh, molybdenum, tungsten. All these, life can't do without these elements. There's a beautiful phrase by uh, David Garner. He says it's, it's the inorganic elements that bring organic chemistry to life. It's the inorganic elements to bring organic chemistry to life. So we're, we're, we're around 19, uh, the comp, well, I've told some, some of the story to some of you, but around about 1989, uh, we came up with this 
hypothesis that it shouldn't be a black smoker where uh, life would have started, but a, a spring that's much more gentle. Um, we predicted that there should be springs away from magma chambers, away from the ocean floor, uh, uh, the uh, mid-oceanic ridges, where generated by water gravitating down into the crust of the Earth, into rocks that are made basically of olivine, which is magnesium iron silicate, uh, and being changed thereby, as they change the crust, reacting with the crust, uh, they would be changed, they'd get hotter, of course, but they'd also become alkaline, for reasons I'll tell you soon, but mainly because of the dissolution of calcium to make calcium hydroxide. Uh, they'd also generate hydrogen, and they'd be at temperature around about 150 degrees, shall we say, something like that. They'd have a bit of sulfur and ammonia, and maybe some organic molecules. I'm not so sure about that anymore, but, but certainly these, these systems this far. And it would come back into the ocean, and it'd be a, like a titration. You, you know, remember doing the burette and titrating one, an acid into an alkaline fluid, or vice versa. So it's like a titration, with the difference that there would be precipitation of inorganic fouling uh, uh, precipitates, uh, crystals of different types or gels that would prevent good interaction between uh, or prevent dispersion of the fluid into the ocean, immediate dispersion. And it's this very frustration that we think is significant in terms of creating organic molecules, creating eventually life as an emergent structure. Uh, so I, because I like to say we should talk about the emergence of life, not the origin of life, but the emergence of life. It's an emergent structure. And that we would suggest that there would be little vesicles or compartments in which one could perhaps uh, have organic reactions between carbon dioxide and hydrogen, and that any organic molecules would be tend to trapped in these inorganic compartments. So this was the idea. And, and notice that we have a, what I like to call a low entropy field, that, we, that it's very well organized, pretty well organized system. Uh, and, and actually, not, not, there's not much variety to it. And about 10 years later, fortunately for us, I guess, uh, uh, such a spring was discovered about 15 kilometers from an ocean ridge. It was discovered by accident. It wasn't prospected for. A PhD student, of course, as so often happens, happened to be looking out the window of the, of the uh, submarine while everybody else was doing whatever they were doing. And this PhD student said, what is that stuff? And everybody kind of went, of course, then everybody went wild. And, here, here was, they found this sort of this little uh, calcium carbonate spring coming out, and uh, then they and they moved in and discovered this incredible place called Lost City. And this, to me, this kind of system here is where energy, this energy we've been talking about, this one, this one volt of energy is discharged, uh, discharged at a hydrothermal site. Uh, and let's have a look at this. It's called Lost City because it looks like some kind of Lost City of Atlantis. It was found in the Atlantic. And that beautiful structures, as you can see, these large structures, uh, and they were almost exact, well, I shouldn't say that. They were kind of comparable to uh, our expectation. Uh, they had a pH of up to 12. They're highly alkaline. They had a temperature up to 94 degrees centigrade. Uh, they had up to high, uh, 15 millimoles of hydrogen, which is a lot of hydrogen two millimoles of uh, methane, and they lasted, you can show, they last for at least 30,000 years. That's on uh, carbon isotopes and on lead isotopes, 100,000 years, and geology tells you they've been perhaps going for a million years. They seem to be a trustworthy system that are thermostatic, round about a temperature like this, perhaps a bit hotter, and they're chemostatic, round about a pH of 12. And you'll notice if you cut through them, then within the structures, these lovely chimneys, uh, and you, there actually there are compartments within these chimneys. And, and in fact, these ones are much more linear than we would have expected. But those, those are the compartments. What's the scale you have? The scale would be, uh, what's that, so 500 micro, it's about a millimeter across here. Oh, here, they go up to 60 meters high. Uh, so, yeah, they're pretty big. 60 meters high. Uh, but so they didn't fit entirely. What's missing <coughs> is there's no sulfide to speak of. There is some sulfide, but no sulfide. Whereas we had argued that there should be sulfide there, and, and we expected the first uh, materials here to be a sulfide deposit rather than the calcium carbonate deposit. And that's a pretty big difference, you could say. 
These conditions are supposed to be the same in the early year. So the, so the problem is they're almost the same, uh, but there's no oxygen in the early year, so that makes a big difference. Uh, the, the ocean is now alkaline, whereas the ocean would have been acidic in those times, so that would have met, that would probably dissolved away some of this cal calcium carbonate. Uh, and as I'm going to go on to say, that uh, because of the lack of oxygen, you might, in certain circumstances, have sulfur in the system. So, and that's something we have to address in the lab. And so, I mean, it's a great question because, of course, as soon as I talk about experiments, everybody is expecting, you know, we're gonna make these super organic molecules like RNA, or if not a rabbit. But in fact, it's very important to try to establish exactly the initial, as close as we can to the initial conditions, because that's you know, where life will start from. Uh, yes, I think that uh, the situation, well, it depends, but the <clears throat> we think there should be thousands of these things, but they're going to be hard to find, and black smokers are so much more attractive to look for that nobody ever bothered to look for these kind of things. But we would imagine there's quite a, would have been a lot of them. There's one, I mean, other ones have been discovered. There's one in northern Iceland, uh, just off northern Iceland. It's a bit different, and, the, and there are fossil ones you can find in the Indian Ocean. But nobody's found another one since 2000 of these exactly like this. But they should exist all the way along, uh, close to the Atlantic. But not, not on the ridge, because that's where the black smokers are, but perhaps where there's still plenty of heat residing in the crust, uh, and still plenty of tectonic activity to give you the openings that allow water to get down. So uh, there should be plenty more. And on the early Earth, we would think there were hundreds of them, perhaps thousands. Spreading. Uh, to some extent, probably. Uh, well, it, well, it is, of course. I mean, it's fracturing, especially on a, a, the Atlantic. The, the, the opening's very slow, uh, and therefore it gets brittle pretty fast, which allows cracks. And because of the topography of the ocean floor, because of the input, there is quite a lot of tectonic or structural activity. On the early Earth, uh, and again, here, here I am in the right context to talk about this, not only is the uh, spinning probably a five hour day, uh, but also the moon is probably just beyond the Roche limit. So there's probably a lot of tidal uh, tectonics on the early Earth. So one would imagine a lot more uh, of these kind of systems because of the tidal activity of the moon. Now, in fact, there's a lot of disagreement about how close the moon was, but um, I don't know if anybody works on uh, lunar orbits here, but it, I mean, it looks as though you can go I mean, if you, if, you, if you take the rate of the moon uh, leaving the Earth at the moment, which is what, two centimeters a year or something, and you play that back, then the moon comes out of the Earth two billion years ago, I believe. So obviously there's something wrong there. But nevertheless, uh, probably it seems to be just beyond the rush limit, is what we're imagining, which is what, 25,000 miles away? I mean, the moon would have been, you know, uh, as, um, you'd be a gas looking at the moon on the early Earth, I think. And, and all that matters is you've got to have cracks that the water can gravitate down. Once it's down there, it gets heated and it's going to come back up. It'll, so you get a convection cell. And in fact, the convection cells all over the world. I mean, so I, don't, I think there's nothing to worry. I'm not worried about this, this part of it particularly. So there's one thing you have to know uh, from a geological point of view about this, uh, about this process, and, and it's the only one actually, and it's called serpentinization. You have to know about serpentinase. Now, in other countries, uh, there's not, many, not much serpentinite in this country, uh, but there are in many countries, many shop windows are not made of lava kite, uh, but they're made of serpentinite. And I'm sure you'll recognize it when you see it. And here it is on the, uh, behind Obama here in the United Nations building in New York. This is all serpentinite. Uh, and you can see how cracked it is. So you can see how permeable it has been in, uh, in times past. And serpentinite is taking that uh, rock that often you'll find in uh, the silica meteorites, the chondrites, uh, and it's olivine, because that's why the Earth made it partly of olivine, plus water gives you magnetite, uh, this oxidized form of, uh, fairly oxidized form, but not that oxidized form of uh, iron oxide, uh, lodestone, in other words, magnetic serpentinite, or serpentine, uh, and an alkali. Uh, and hydrogen. Now, I haven't put the formula for serpentine on. Oh, yes, I have. Okay, here's a formula for serpentine. Uh, mostly magnesium with some reduced iron, 
and it's a silicate, and it's a silicate because an hydroxylated silicate. So that's what it looks like. It started off as this magnesium ion silicate. The iron gets oxidized a little bit, uh, and that's and therefore reduces. The, it gets oxidized by the water, so it releases hydrogen. So hydrogen, of course, is the fuel. That's what carries the electrons from the, the uh, crust of the Earth uh, towards the surface. So this is our main fuel for, for life. And, and perhaps a little bit of magnesium, certainly calcium, uh, gets dissolved to give you the uh, alkaline system. And in fact, uh, you can also get some methane, as I've talked about. And, and you can think of this as kind of linear uh, reduction from C carbon dioxide to formic acid, to formaldehyde, to, to methyl alcohol, and finally to methane. So the Earth can do this, uh, but it's just life can do it better. So here, here we're looking at uh, the reduction of carbon dioxide, or the hydrogenation of carbon dioxide as we go in this direction, to make methane. And one of the points is, in terms of the thermodynamics, it's uphill. It's, a, it's an endergonic reaction to get from carbon dioxide through formate to formaldehyde. It's uphill. Once you're up there, of course, you make a little bit of formaldehyde, and then that becomes, that is, is easily hydrogenated to, to methanol, and, and then very easily uh, hydrogenated to methane. So you can see there's a lot of energy in the system. The problem is you've got to climb up to get the, to get the full energy. Now, were this to be a facile process, were it to be easy to get from, shall we say, CO2 to methane and down to, uh, sorry, uh, yes, uh, from CO2 to methanol and down to methane, or even indeed, if you could do it like that, then there would be no life in the cosmos. It's because of this problem, so to speak, this, this uh, thermodynamic hurdle that there's life, because life is the catalyst, it becomes the catalyst uh, for this reaction to speed up. So which is one of the other points about you know, not asking what life is, you know, because we, that makes us take life too seriously. Yeah, well, you know what I mean. Uh, so what about the, the, the archaebacteria that can do this? They're called the methanogens, or the methanoarchaea. So here, and this is what, now they find that they can use a catalyst to uh, circumvent some of the problem, but they do need an ionic gradient to drive from CO2 to uh, formate, and then it's downhill. So you've got to have some energy to get into the system. It's not just catalysis. And this can either be a sodium gradient or a hydrogen, a proton gradient. And we argue that on the early Earth, it would have been a proton gradient for the reasons I suggested, because you've got proton-rich ocean and a proton poor alkaline solution coming in. So, so this is rather similar to the way the world does it. Uh, but of course, in doing it, it's, you've got to get some energy out of the system to actually drive other uh, ke organic chemical reactions. So, and I think that that was probably too complicated, and I, I can go into the reasons afterwards, but I think life found it easier to make acetic acid first. So this is Make, going from carbon dioxide through to formate up to formaldehyde, <coughs> formaldehyde and, and methylene, right down to CH3, a methyl group, and that reacted with, a, with carbon monoxide to make this acetic acid. And I would say that that's the key, that's the key first reaction, to make acetate. Uh, it's a kind of biochemical vortex, if you like. Uh, and it, but it, the energy input now is adenosine triphosphate, just the same as we use it. But on the early Earth, of course, there would have been no adenine, so it probably just was a triphosphate. Uh, but that's what we required to get to jump up here before we could get down. Uh, and here, from a life detection point of view, is intriguing because if the Earth can't make, if the Earth can make methane, so we don't know whether the methane on Mars is biological or not. But if you could find acetic acid on Mars, and it's, it's a tall order, but if you could, then I, I would argue then that would definitely be an indicator of life. It's a very ordinary indicator of life. You know, we're not looking at something very complicated, but surely the obvious thing to do if you're looking for an indicator of life is to look for the output, is to look for the effluent. So I think that's the earliest effluent. <clears throat> So 
So, so we can kind of update our uh, view of uh, our model of this system. So we're going to cap the system uh, that makes, shall we say, methane. Uh, we're going to cap the hydrogen here, and we're going to try and see how we can quicken these reactions. So here goes the water, goes down. Uh, we think now it goes down to the brittle to ductile zone, so whatever that, where that is. So it's cracked down to here, and it's too soft here for the water to go deeper. Uh, probably because of making this soft mineral called serpentinite. So, uh, so here's the serpentinite, uh, and the water returns, pH 10 to 12, perhaps a tiny amount of formate, certainly some methane, but a lot of hydrogen. It comes back, follow this titration, uh, and now we've got precipitates of iron sulfide, nickel sulfide in silica for the most part, uh, and there's, plenty, there's nickel available and so forth. Uh, carbon dioxide in the outside. So this is the kind of frustrating area that creativity needs, I would argue. And here are the kind of bubbles that we considered were the first kind of compartments of life. And it seems to me to have, very important to have compartmentation at the origin of life. You can't have a, just a free surface. You've got to have a container. Uh, so this is how uh, we see that part of the process. And one other good thing about this is you've got to have waste disposal. And here's natural waste disposal into the ocean of anything that's left over, like acetic acid, as we would say, and eventually methane. So we go into the lab, uh, and first of all, we just, I mean, the most prosaic thing we do is actually to show that we can get sulfide into these solutions, because there's none to speak of in Lost City, but four billion years ago, were there to be sulfide in the, sulfide in the crust, iron sulfide, for example, we wanted to see, could we move this in solution uh, in our alkaline solution? So here's very crudely, so what we do is we have a vessel here, uh, and that's full of uh, ocean water, as we imagined it four billion years ago. In this vessel, we have hydrothermal solution, uh, 120 degrees, 130 degrees centigrade, and we can choose whether to put ocean or uh, or hydrothermal solution into a reactor. So here's our central reactor. And we pack the reactor with serpentinite, uh, olivine, uh, iron sulfide, uh, and uh, basalt wool. And we allow the water to go through here. It's under hydrogen pressure anyway. And see what comes out. And what comes out is significant amounts of methane. So, I mean, it's amazing. You can do it within four hours, we're making methane. Uh, and uh, also sulfide. So we take this fluid out of the, uh, this effluent from our reactor and put it into another, go to another lab to put it into our ocean vessels, so this is Hadean ocean water, and see what happens. And we make what looks like quite nice chimneys, just the same, uh, or a hydrothermal mound, if you like. So to this, to us, this is a fantastic result. Uh, it doesn't sound great to you, but... If you're hearing people saying that's got to be wrong because there's no sulfide, then at least we've passed that test. Uh, and yes, as I say, we can make uh, methane easily. We can show that we can uh, easily get uh, sulfide into solution up to 14 millimoles. Uh, and it's rather a short time for a lot of sulfide, but it settles down to one or two millimoles of sulfide, which is actually plenty of sulfide. So then we can cut these open and see what they look like. Uh, so here's, here's one particular, and what's this, 100 microns across. So here's one vesicle made of, that we made. You know, if you're cutting this, then this is what they look like inside. And inside this, you find even smaller ones with smooth surfaces on the outside, in this case, and incredibly complicated in, internal uh, precipitates with a huge amount of surface area. And so we, we think of these as our early compartments of life. And this, these here, these two micron wide uh, areas are the first membrane, our first membrane, as we, as we understand it. So let's go, just to remind ourselves then of how the whole system works, it's, uh, as we like to think it works, so we call it the, the rocky roots of the acetal coenzyme synthase pathway, because what we're trying to do is, <coughs> well, we think acetate or acetyl is very significant to the emergence of life, and so we think that the earliest uh, pathway, metabolic pathway, was this pathway. 
So I, I'm not sure how many people have heard of things like cycles and hypercycles and the Krebs cycle and so forth and uh, Schuster and Eigen and all these things. We don't need cycles. You imagine if you've got a high energy system geologically, we know that it's going to go downhill. It's going to be a pathway. It's not going to be a cycle. You only need cycles uh, or hypercycles if you've got a high entropy feed, organic molecules raining in from space or being generated in a, an atmosphere. Let me, let me just emphasize, you know, there's never been a geologist since Darwin ever thought the atmosphere was anything other than carbon dioxide. Uh, I mean, the big change came when Harold Urey wondered what to do with his new PhD student called uh, uh, Miller. What's his name, first name? Stanley, Stanley Miller. Uh, what to do with him and thought, well, maybe the atmosphere of the Earth was like Jupiter which was very unfortunate. I mean, it was unfortunate in a way because they made amino acids, and you could say that's how astrobiology started. But in terms of misinformation, it was an appalling error. So uh, here's our hydrothermal system. Hydrogen, ammonia, maybe some cyanide, uh, sulfide, molybdenum and tungsten sulfide coming into the system, interacting, precipitating immediately to make one of these mounds. And if you look at carefully at the mound, you'll find little compartments within the mound and that's where we think the hydrogen and in, will interact with the carbon dioxide, make acetate or methane, which will escape, uh, and we will retain the organic precursors of life. So if, you, if you're looking for a prebiotic molecule, as so many people do, then I would say the pre, there's only one really pre, or two prebiotic molecules. There's carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So what can we say experimentally about this? Well, Gunter Bechtesheuser and Uwe Claudia, uh, Claudia Uber in, uh, in G Germany uh, did a reaction which I think is pretty intriguing. It, it actually rather suggests more than it was, but what they managed to do was to add methane, uh, methyl sulfide, which actually is not a natural, probably, organic molecule, but anyway, they, they, played, they reacted out with carbon monoxide rather than carbon dioxide, but they did make what's called activated acetate, an acetate that's activated through this sulfur. So this is, remember, <clears throat> acetate is CH3COO. And instead of the O, you've got a sulfur here, and that's what makes it activated. It can, it can react with other molecules because of this weak sulfur bond. <coughs> and they showed that they could do this using a nickel ion catalyst, and this made a fantastic yield of 40%, so it's an amazing yield. Uh, but I think that it's more significant to notice that actually most, this is a very tight uh, system here, but mo most of the, the reaction, the best reactions are happening at high pH. They're happening in alkaline solutions. And they're not necessarily using iron sulfide. They, nickel sulfate works pretty well. I mean, you know, 30%, I mean, the organic geochemists would think that's not bad. 30% uh, yield just for nickel sulfate. So you can't make iron pyrites, which is what they argue is required of the origin of life. You can't make iron pyrites out of nickel sulfate, or nickel sulfide for that matter. But nevertheless, it's a fantastic experiment and gives us a kind of a first look at the possibility of making uh, acetic acid. They had the, it's probably not significant to you, but they had the idea that pyrite, this fool's gold, was what drove everything. And I just want to emphasize that here's iron, and this iron is protected by 12 sulfurs. This looks nothing like a biological molecule, nothing like it. So I don't, this might be a waste product, but it's certainly not involved in early biology. So here's some of the systems we make. So here's a chimney, for example, in this case, and here's some little compartments on the side of the chimney. Uh, and here's looking down the bottom of the chimney, and these things have uh, ephemeral diaphanous surfaces. Uh, and within that chimney, you do find iron sulfide, but it's iron monosulfide, and it's Fe2S2, basically. It's iron, sulfur, iron, sulfur. And you just put them together, and you make this mineral called, that's the, the basic structure of mechanolide. So I think this is a major significance. It's a semiconducting mineral. And uh, we actually, so this, is, this is rather out of place, but this, this, we're looking at the side of these chimneys now. Uh, and admittedly, I've added some uh, some peptide to this. We don't need to add peptide. <coughs> I should have put it somewhere else. But what I'd like you to see is look at the beautiful corrugations on this, implying we've kind of got a, a kind of periodicity, which implies precipitation at 
far from equilibrium. But some, many of you will know much more about this kind of thing than I do. But that, if, if the surface of the chimney looks like this, then one could imagine that, that that's what the chemistry is doing, although we can't see it. Uh, there might be some self-organizing chemistry going on. It's rather similar. Anyway, we were looking at McKinawite, you remember? Here it is. Iron, sulfur, iron, sulfur. And we look at that absolutely vital first protein, or first enzyme, which is called hydrogenase, which needs to break hydrogen into two electrons and two protons. That's absolutely necessary. And look at the structure that does it. Iron, sulfur, iron, sulfur. So, so of course, it's in a complex protein now, but it's using exactly the same kind of... Uh, What's the word? Uh, anyway, confirmation. Exactly the same confirmation as the mineral. So one, you could imagine the mineral could do such a job, perhaps, not very effectively. But two, you could imagine that if you had some organic molecules, they could perhaps sequester this to make it to improve on this as a, a hydrogenase. So the hydrogenase makes two protons and two electrons. And these, you've got to do that. You've got to have charge splitting for in, for, chemi for good chemi chemical interactions. But if you oxidize or sulfidize this mineral called McKinawite, you put these two rhombic structures together. So you've got a structure like this, and then you put another one together and you make a cube. So iron, sulfur, iron, sulfur, iron, sulfur, iron, sulfur. So we've got a little cube now, and it goes off to two other sulfurs to a tetrahedral site, which could either be oxidized iron, Fe3+, plus, or it can be nickel, depending on the amount of nickel in the, in the system. And oftentimes, it's about 20% nickel to iron, 20% uh, nickel, or 10 to 20% nickel to iron, or I could say that as a ratio, uh, as well as the salt. <clears throat> so the actual mineral is called gregite, as in Greek, uh, just a well, you know the composer Greek, who actually is a McGregor, uh, and the McGregors were, I worked in Scotland for 30 years, so McGregor, the Campbells decided to dismiss the Gregors and wouldn't allow the name in Scotland, so the, Mac the McGregors all had to escape, and some of them went to America and discovered a mineral, and, and some of them went to Norway and made beautiful music. <laughs> uh, they just dropped a Mac, that's all. Uh, and uh, anyway, five, Fe5NIS8, it's, it's a typical... Uh, mineral uh, constitution. So, in this, so we make it in these kind of uh, it's these kind of chimneys. We look at that mineral. Let's compare this mineral to acetylcoenzyme A synthase. Remember that was the first pathway, acetylcoenzyme A synthase pathway, the rocky roots. Well, here's here's the pathway, and this is sorry, this this is the actual uh, enzyme or the active center of the enzyme that does that job. It takes what it does is it takes uh, a seat, well, this is two nickels here in this case. Here's that cubane. Look how similar it is to this cubane. It goes off to two sulfurs in the mineral, one sulfur in, in actually the, the uh, enzyme center itself of the cluster to nickel. And this nickel is where it all happens. Carbon monoxide and the methyl group, just like in the vectorizer experiment, goes into one on, on that side and, and is there joined together. So this is the point. And the, uh, there's another <coughs> uh, enzyme that's incredibly similar to this. In fact, it's in the same protein structure. It's called carbon monoxide dehydrogenase. And it's, got an ex it's very similar to this indeed. It's, it doesn't have the second nickel. But otherwise, so you can see that this kind of, you could see that perhaps this might do the job of reducing the carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide and also helping carbon monoxide to interact with the methyl group. Very Weakly, but nevertheless, not a bad catalyst, especially if it's fine grain uh, or, or gel-like. Uh, and that eventually, not only that, but perhaps a protein could kind of take this over. Uh, so again, so what, what we're saying here really is that there's still a huge canyon between geochemistry and biochemistry. But the one thing about the, can the canyon is at least we're on the opposite sides of the canyon. We're not down this. We're not on another canyon. We're across this canyon. And it's a big gap. But nevertheless, uh, you know, maybe we can see each other from the other side. So, the, yes, it's just to emphasize this is where it happens, on this side here. And 
left algorithm, CO makes this uh, uh, acetyl group as nickel is oxidized from nickel zero to nickel two. So if we now look at the history of life very quickly, very crudely, uh, this is five billion years ago, so the Earth formed at 4.567, if it happens, uh, billion years ago. Uh, and I'm not going to worry about this part it's particularly. What I'm going to say is that all the early enzymes are metalloenzymes. So, so LUCA stands for the last universal common ancestor. We know that in the last universal common ancestor, there was always a molybdenum or perhaps tungsten enzyme. So there's, that's the importance of molybdenum and tungsten. Uh, there was a nitric oxide reductase, which happens to be a copper enzyme, a single copper. There's nickel iron hydrogenase, which I've already shown you. And there's acid coenzyme A synthase and carbon monoxide dehydrogenase. And they're all there in the last universal common ancestor. And they've all got, or nearly all of them, got mineral counterparts. Later on, as you get evolution, then you lose a lot of these minerals. Uh, mineral centers or metal centers. And of course you do that because as you oxidize the planet, there's not so much metal to go for. And some of you have heard of siderophores. You know, siderophores are things to go out from the bacteria to get metals because they're so sparse in the present ocean. And some of you have heard the idea that maybe one way to reduce the carbon dioxide is to put a lot of iron in the ocean so that you can have more biological activity. Anyway, the point is that we needed those metals to start with. And they're there. So we can go back to another vector slicer experiment to show that actually, if you can get to make an, a, a carbonic acid, of, sorry, a, a carboxylic acid of some kind, then if you, you can easily turn that into an amino acid. Uh, and here he's doing it with iron sulfide or ferrous hydroxide, it doesn't matter which. Uh, he's, he's, he's basically aminating or adding ammonia to uh, these what are called alpha keto acids, they're carboxylic acids. <coughs> and he's making things like tyrosine, alanine, at 50%. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, and uh, phenylalanine and glutamate, very high uh, amounts. Uh, at good temperatures, 75 degrees centigrade. I think they're all 50 to 75 degrees centigrade. Uh, always notice, though, at pH 9. Again, we're in this alkaline solution. So we, I mean, you could call the model the alkaline solution to the emergence of life. And uh, one can also show that in these conditions, uh, you can condense oligoglycines to uh, trimethophosphate. In other words, you can put, you can make something rather like ATP from monophosphate. Sorry, you can do that anyway. And using that, you can dimerize glycine. So the glycine is the simplest amino acids, and you can make a peptide, uh, uh, two glycines together. And you can do that relatively rapidly at pH around about 9, with a yield of about 20%. So these are pretty high yields. But to, put, to make four glycines, then, you know, to make a, a polymer or a peptide of four glycines, then, in fact, that happens better at lower pH. But, of course, in our system, you can just use protons coming through the membrane to generate the, uh, the, 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 the uh, four mer glycine. And in fact, although the yield isn't so good, you can make, they have made, Yamagata et al., Yamanaka et al., have made it, uh, six glycines all together in a row. So it's like, a bit like a protein, but it's not coded. There's no coding. We've got no RNA or DNA. But, but this is pretty useful anyway, because we've got, so here's just four amino acids in a string. So we've just seen how they could be made in this system. And when they're, <coughs> they're made, we don't care what the side chains are. We don't care what, what, what uh, type of amino acid that is, because what actually matters is that you've got these uh, amine groups that uh, the nitrogen uh, bonds to the sulfur through a hydrogen bond. So in other words, you're making a little nest to go around these iron sulfides that we've just seen one can make in the laboratory. So we've got these structures that look like this, and they could be nested. We call these the, the eggs to these particular peptide nests. So what's happening here, all you're relying on is the backbone of the peptide, not on the side chains, just the backbone. And so these are, there's one amino acid, two, three, four, five in this case. We need five, after all. Uh, now, this makes the, the uh, enzyme with what is thought to be the longest pedigree, or 
or certainly one of the longest pedigrees. It's called theridoxin. Ther as in iron, re as in reduction, ox as in oxidation. So theridoxin. The significance of the theridoxin is it can take and lose, keep or and lose an electron, and making very little difference to its conformation. It just kind of breathes off topo topology, I should say. It just breathes, it goes in and out, but it doesn't change the structure. This, this cubane is an extremely forgiving structure. So it can take uh, and lose an electron. But more exciting to my mind is that, and mo much more obvious, is that the, the same thing can happen with a little phosphate. So if you have a little phosphate, one phosphate or two or three phosphates, this can be nested. And in fact, this reaction now, this hydrogen bond is much stronger to the, to the oxygens than it was to the sulfide. And so you've done the same thing with the two types of uh, inorganic um, materials that matter most. You've got the iron nickel sulfides, which can be kind of sequestered. Uh, and perhaps I should have said, even today in modern ferrodoxins, they are also in a nest. Uh, and now and they do the electron job. This can do the proton job. So the electrons can kind of reduce the carbon dioxide, <clears throat> but the protons can make pyrophosphate, and the, the pyrophosphate can be used to make polymers, like, as we've just seen, uh, polyglycine. So this is called, the, this is a nest. <clears throat> now, truly, in all bacteria, in all archaea, to this day, all phosphates are ligated in exactly that way, in a peptide nest. It's called the P-loop. And here, <clears throat> and it varies quite a lot in its constituents, except it always has glycine here, four amino acids, glycine, and then uh, lysine, and then another amino acid, always. Uh, and oftentimes you'll have another glycine here, and sometimes another one here, and on occasion they'll all be glycine. That's very rare, and that's one in the bios. But, gen but what are the glycines doing there? Well, the glycines are there because they have no chirality. So they give flexibility to the peptide. We don't want the peptide deciding to be a, 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 a beta helix or an alpha sheet. We want it to be entirely flexible. So it's the glycine that allows it to be flexible. But on the early Earth, it would have been achiral. You wouldn't have had a chirality to the, uh, the amino acids. They would all be a mixture, and therefore they would have been flexible anyway. To maintain the structure in a coded society, so to speak, in a coded environment, uh, then you would have to have the glycines to maintain that flexibility. <clears throat> so here's the P loop, just to put that point. Uh, we're missing one glycine here, we've got one here. Glycine, glycine, valine, glycine, uh, lysine, and serine. So here's exactly that loop for what's called the GTP. So here's the three, the three phosphates in this case, and this, uh, these are how the phosphates are ligated. Uh, from the nitrogens through the hydrogens to the to the oxygens. <clears throat> so we've got something that looks like the structure of met uh, metabolic life to our mind. And, and now we, we speculate further to think that maybe the first way of transferring phosphates was if you've got an eight-mer peptide, perhaps all glycine, it doesn't matter, then you can actually uh, uh, join the you can, uh, sorry, you can, you, can split the, you can split the phosphates, you can hydrolyze the phosphates and, uh, and make the phosphate go, for example, to, the, to this part of the, the carboxylic acid part of the uh, peptide, and you split here. Alternatively, if you put protons in the system, so magnesium plus two phosphates can be made, can be made pyrophosphate plus water uh, in this system, as long as you've got enough protons. Notice you always use magnesium or nearly always use magnesium. What does the magnesium do? It prevents the repulsion between two highly uh, uh, electron-rich phosphates. So the magnesium take, uh, takes away the repulsion so the two phosphates can interact, nested in such a system that can keep water out, which of course that's also important. So you're kind of looking at another kind of linear compartmentation. And just out of interest, if we, and this is just a big jump now, but just, well, it interests me hugely, and that is right in the middle of the ribosome, which is what uh, basically is responsible for, eventually, for coding. Uh, right in the middle of the ribosome, there is another, there's just a peptide. Not, not a, it's not a barrel or anything, it's just a single peptide, 
And even this, this, this is to keep magnesium in the middle of the ribosome. And here, even there, you've got three glycines in a row and another glycine here. So, so you can do a lot, I, I'd say, with a peptide on the early, in, in, in early life or earliest metabolism. And if we can do that, I don't want to lose you on this, and my God, it's four o'clock anyway, but uh, then we can imagine the proton gradient making pyrophosphates and the pyrophosphates getting nested by amino acids, uh, making amino acids, sorry, getting nested in amino acids, making them that and making more and longer and longer amino acids, feeding back to the system to look after, to make uh, the phosphates more effective because now they're nested. Because if you think about that phosphate, it's now got the maximum surface area to volume. Uh, it's prevented from dissolving and it's prevented from crystallizing. So this peptide system is terribly significant. Now I've been going an hour and I feel like it, so I don't know if you want to, can we at least stop there for a moment? If you want to ask any questions or make yeah. any yeah. Maybe, uh, we should maybe thank uh, Russell for those people who want to sit here after that. But I hope that will not be the case. Really. <laughs> <laughs> what should we do? Up to you. I mean, how come uh, more uh, time remains? Uh, I'd quite like a break for questions, or at least a glass of water, and then probably another 20 minutes. Okay, uh, let me ask you a question first of all. I mean, there's a, a number of the actions that you have all been uh, able to think about that could be fitting into the long chain from the, from the origin of life to something which can uh, accomplish lifelike, lifelike catalysis and so on. And, and a number of these reactions are perhaps quite difficult to, to, to memorize and to, to get straight in our heads, especially even after the second time we hear these. So, uh, for, for example, the, the uh, one key piece that I, I like, that was perhaps one of the simpler ones, was the Makinavite, or Makinavite, as you pronounce it, uh, which was acting as uh, hydrogenase. Um, so is, is that actually a process that is well known and uh, uh, accepted, or what is, what is the situation? And of course, there's uh, many other such uh, things that you mentioned. So, uh, well, it was an Im the embarrassed answer to that is that, but the excuse is that it's taken me 20 years to work on the initial conditions, uh, because I think that origin of life was in a real mess. Uh, and I want to make sure I got the initial conditions right, and also to show that one can do things. I mean, it looks simple now, but to show we can make compartments that include McKinnaway. Nobody's done the experiment yet to show that this, this works like that. But on the other hand, uh, there is a lot, I mean, what you have to do in this circumstance, because there's so much to do, is that you look around for uh, examples from elsewhere. It can be industry, the nuclear industry, or it can be lakes in so, for example, there's a lake in West Africa, which uh, every now and then explodes carbon dioxide to the, that kills people and cattle and so on. And that carbon dioxide is at 10 atmospheres. So, and, and the pH is about 5.3. So that's our early ocean. Uh, for the McKinnawite, what we know is that in the nuclear industry, one of the problems of McKinnawite was uh, that, uh, sorry, one of the problems in the nuclear industry was uh, embrittling of the pipes uh, steel pipes through hydrogen production. So what? And so, so guess what? In the in in the pipes they found McKinnawite, and they found that uh, on the ends of the McKinnawite, which was growing out of the internal pipes, then the bacteria grew actually at that point. And so what that at least tells us is that they're getting the electrons straight from the steel through the McKinnawite. Now it doesn't actually say it's a hydrogenase, but it's doing the kind of thing that we would appeal to in terms of electron transfer. And in fact, hydrogen is generated in this circumstance, and it's the hydrogen that's generated in that way that makes the embrittlement. Now, that's a rather poor answer. Of course, what we need to do is we've got to do this in the lab, and we haven't yet. Mm. Uh, but it's a wide open field. You know, anybody, I mean, hard, when you think about it, hardly anybody works on the early origin of life. And how many people work on string theory? I mean, it's ludicrous. <laughs> well, so I didn't mean that as an insult. I mean, I mean, I just meant the ratio was uncomfortable. 
related to this is perhaps the, uh, the, the Gregite, uh, which is in some sense even more exciting, of course, because if I understand you correctly, that is what is generate, generating acid light. Yeah. So what is that, the experiment? Well, uh, well, the only experiments so far are the magnetizer experiments, which yeah. are rather, which they're kind of not as good as their boast, actually. And to put it crudely, it, it's not CO2 to acetate. It's CO and, and methylene. So what they've done, they've shown that the acetal coenzyme synthase part of it works, but they haven't shown that the carbon monoxide dehydrogen, which is much more significant. So you could say that's another job for us, eventually, or anybody who wants to play it for you. Do I understand you correctly that these would be basically at these uh, two different poles of uh, origin of bacteria and bacteria that you would... Uh, no, they would be in exactly the same enzyme. Uh, it's often called ACS, A and B, or so, but they have both of these structures in the enzymes along with peridoxins for the electron transfer, and they're in the same site. What I said about that, and probably I should leave leave that, that point to the end. Yes, and maybe that is the, the question to you, but uh, are there any other questions at this point? Uh, here the um, proposal for making Akira and Bacteria. Okay. Yes, please. Anybody want to please feel free. So, I, I mean, the the next part is very complicated, so I don't want to go into it too detailed, if you don't mind. But, but as I say, anybody who wants, <coughs> the, the presentation is freely available and everything's well referenced in, in there. So if you're interested, uh, that's what to do. So let, let me just go back to remind us of the model, if you, if you don't mind one more time. So what I would say is we have all the energy and all the materials for the emergence of life, all in one particular focused Place. Uh, so I, I would say that's a quite a good advantage for the model. It, it doesn't rely on contingency at all. There's no contingency. Uh, beyond the fact that maybe it would be good to have a little bit of sulfide in here, and it's not wouldn't be always the case. And as I mean, I've gone over and over this, but just to remind ourselves of the significance that, that we don't have to invent the proton motive force. And, and it would be impossible. To, I mean, when one thinks about it, it would be impossible to invent it from scratch. It is an aspect of the initial conditions. Protons can come through the membrane, react with the phosphate to make pyrophosphate, which can act as the preliminarizing agent for amino acids that we've seen to be made uh, in other circumstances within the mouth. And what we're suggesting is, and it, it looks very complicated, but what we're suggesting is that we found we found a bacterium that can that can make <coughs> hydrogen and carbon dioxide. It's a fermenting bacterium. It's just like the kind of bacterium that can make alcohol. But in this case, it makes vinegar. No, not vinegar, it makes formula. <coughs> so if it can do that uh, from uh, hydrogen and CO2, can we reverse this process? Notice that, so if we do this, we can, CO2, sorry, the way it works is that uh, CO2 and hydrogen can react on a nickel ion sulfide with the help of molybdenum a lot, as long as protons come through the membrane to make formic acid. So here is another experiment that we, I mean, it always seems in the future, but this is the next kind of thing we want to do. Can we make, could we make formic acid in one of these structures that we make in the lab? Or should we be looking at uh, using alternative methods like uh, microfluidics? which we discussed earlier, whether, whether we should just try and not look at it too similarly to the way it is, but actually look at a microfluidic approach to this. But anyway, this is, this is the next significant experiment. Making, so we, we, we want to make pyrophosphate, uh, and once we make pyrophosphate, we would like to make formic acid uh, from CO2 and hydrogen using the proton motive force, using the natural proton gradient coming through the membrane. So that would, that would be the critical next step. So one way of thinking about, uh, I talked about redox gradients, and I don't know if you're ever, any of you are familiar with this kind of uh, 
uh, diagram, but this is called a Pourbe diagram or an EHPH diagram. And what you're looking at is pH, which is common enough, but here you're looking at the equivalent of electron activity. So here, this is the hydrogen field here. This is the water field. This is the oxygen field. And of course, the way life works right now is to have, for example, us, uh, we breathe in that oxygen. Our cell fluid is something like around about here. And we breathe in this oxygen, and that's what gives us this energy, about a volt of energy, which helps us to make things like ATP. <clears throat> On the early Earth, one could use, instead of oxygen, one can use, we would say nitric oxide would be a very good start as an electron acceptor. Uh, and nitric oxide comes out of volcanoes in significant amounts. Other possibilities are using ferric iron and some sulfur, which also comes out of volcanoes. <clears throat> but actually, of course, what we need to do is to reduce CO2. Now, let's just forget we're worrying about life at all. We're, and let's say we're just going to worry about how the Earth is going to come to terms with such an oxidized exterior. It doesn't care which electronic much. It doesn't care much which electron acceptor it uses. Here's, here's the, hy the hydrogen. We're on the hydrogen water boundary here. The hydrogen wants to lose its electron. It doesn't care where they're going to go. And of course, if possible, actually they'll go to nitric oxide. So you say, well, isn't that enough? Well, the paradox is that there's not very much nitric oxide on the planet, but there's a gigantic amount of carbon dioxide. So if you lose one electron, shall we say, from molybdenum to nitric oxide, you've now got a more energetic electron that can now reduce the carbon dioxide, of which there's lots and lots and lots. So, uh, so it's going to be the next thing to be reduced. So we would argue that this is another way of looking at... Uh, the, the emergence of life, and that is the resolution of the chemical uh, redox tension uh, or electron tension between the hydrogen coming out of the hot spring, shall we say, and nitric oxide. So that, that's another energy source, and that explains why molybdenum or tungsten is always required by life, or at least early life, as you go down the uh, evolutionary tree. So uh, so how can we look at this then? So here's, here's the same kind of thing, but looking much more biologically. So we're turning our <coughs> initial iron sulfide membranes now with antibregite and so forth. And we're, going to, we're making more peptide here, and eventually uh, we get to an RNA era, and, uh, uh, and, and that's when we thought there might be uh, peptides involved, and a finally a DNA era, and then finally we get to the universal ancestor, uh, which exists we would argue within the first few thousand years that you would go to the emergence of life within a few thousand years, maybe sooner than that. Uh, and this is the point, again, I'm going off on a tangent, but this is the point that Axel was talking about. Not, we can also, not only, uh, we can jump ahead now and saying, supposing we've got RNA or DNA, then we can use this system, which is hot here and cold here, as a kind of polymerase a natural convective polymerase chain reaction. You may know how the polymerase chain reaction works through heating up DNA, which denatures it, which allows other uh, uh, nucleotides to fit together in that uh, what uh, Crick's and Watts, uh, what's his name? Watson, Watson, Watson. Crick's, Crick and Watson method, uh, and join to get, cool them down, join them together, and you've got Basically, you've, sorry, you've made two, uh, you've made two RNAs or DNAs. Just so, so let me do that again. So you've got, you've got a, and you've got these two parts of the helix. They, they, you heat them to 95 degrees centigrade. They split apart. There's other nucleotides. The nucleotides fit together to make a new DNA uh, uh, as you call as you call it down, and then you heat it up again. So and those two become four, and the four become eight, and so forth. So you have a what's called a polymerase chain reaction. And uh, Dieter Braun uh, and Liphaber thought of the idea that maybe you could do it in a hydrothermal vent. So they kind of adopted a uh, hydrothermal vent to say, well, maybe the first uh, build-up of things like DNA were related to the uh, natural polymerase chain reaction. But not only that, you also got thermal diffusion due to the thermal gradient, and that thermal gradient would tend to concentrate any long-charged molecules like DNA and concentrate them by many orders of magnitude. So this was a way of actually uh, not only generating uh, DNA and regenerating it, but also concentrating it 
uh, and to the exclusion of uh, a lot of the water, which of course life would need. So that's, that's an, another aspect, it's a huge jump of course, uh, and, it, and what we're looking at now is a thermal gradient instead of a, a redox and, hydro and a proton gradient. So, so here, so now I have come to the end, well I've got a lot more that I can go on to if anybody's interested to stay after this for, for discussion, but because partly because I'm talking to you, is I think it, it's a nice way of thinking about <coughs> life. I mean, oftentimes people are, they, they get mixed up and they say, are you working on the Big Bang? I mean, how often am I after, uh, working on the Big Bang? And I say, well, you could say that. And I think you could say that. So here's the Big Bang, and we know that even this is controversial, but I follow Sean Carroll's idea. Uh, he's written a book this year called Eternity Here, and if anybody's heard of it, I wonder if you realize that the, the, the joke in here, of course, is the first sexy movie was called From Here to Eternity. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he's turned it around. You know, he lives in Hollywood or pretty close by. You know, what does a Californian do? Uh, this is now. This was the Big Bang. So we make a comparison with that. And, and the comparison is that maybe this was a kind of a, a low energy, terribly low energy previous universe, who knows, and that we get this kind of... Uh, huge fluctuation and suddenly you get a big bang now comes the low entropy high entropy universe so while we make a, a broad comparison with this we emphasize that geochemistry cannot become biochemistry biochemistry isn't just better geochemistry now one of the things about i say there's not many people working on an origin of life there are people working on it but they're working on geochemical reactions assuming that those geochemical reactions, if only they could improve on the catalysis, will become biochemical. And we argue that they will not, because there's a true discontinuity here. And the discontinuity uh, is obviated by the use of the natural protomotive force. And it's the natural protomotive force that allows biochemistry to take off. And then you'll remember there were two reactions that we could do uh, that we were, were kind of obvious to us. And that was one was to make methane and one was to make acetate. Now, this is highly speculative, but what we would argue is that, in fact, there are different parts of this hydrothermal mound where acetate is being generated and elsewhere methane is being generated. <coughs> and that it's these, this, this very differentiation that actually gives us the, a bifurcation right at the beginning of life. At the last universal common ancestor, we argue that the bacteria made acetic acid and that the archaea made methane. Uh, so this, that, that to us is, is the significance of the split. And you may say, well, <clears throat> why would there be a split there? You know, they're, they're pretty similar to look at. Well, the bacteria became the kind of all-purpose uh, entropy generators in, 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 the, in our world. Uh, they, they, they could do all kinds of things, you know, and they invade our bodies, for example, uh, as heterotrophs. Uh, and they can even do oxygenic photosynthesis. I mean, eventually, they evolved to do the, what was really the next big stage on the Earth, the origin of life, and then oxygenic photosynthesis probably increased productivity by a, a factor of 20. So that was an incredible deal. Uh, so why am I saying this? Well, they can do everything, but they can't make methane. You seem to need uh, an archaea to make methane. So again, it seems that this is a very specialized, rather conservative, pretty sturdy kind of uh, system, the archaea, uh, and now the two domains of life. There are only three domains of life on the planet. Uh, Otto Kandler, for example, in Germany, and the Volt, and uh, Carl Vos in, uh, in America came out with this discovery about 25 years ago, 30 years ago, incredible discovery, that, the, that some of these bacteria weren't bacteria at all, they were archaea, and they made this differentiation between the archaea and the bacteria, and then they hybridize to make eukaryotes, which basically is trees, us, frogs, and so on. So there's those three domains, and we'd say the first two came out at once. Uh, and I was suggesting that, <clears throat> admittedly taking a leaf out of Prigogine's book, that, uh, that these bifurcations were something to be expected at the origin of a, a self-organizing, far from equilibrium system. And I think that is it, yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks for bringing us to this point. And let me ask the questions here. Dr. Wolf, 
know this organism which makes methane. Yes. That the peculiar living organism. Yes. In fact, it's it's a very worrying organism because uh, yeah, methane is a a. a, a Oh, you're getting tired. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's causing global warming. It, it, it takes in much more. It, it keeps much more energy. In, in it's more responsible for global warming uh, by a factor of twenty than carbon dioxide. So if you so if the methanogens are busy using carbon dioxide to make methane, then that's pretty bad news. And and one of the problems about you know global warming is the positive feedback to the the bogs and the deep sea deposits of, of uh, methane and methane clathrates. So the warmer it gets, the more methane comes up. So that's that's a real worry. But there's a paper in Nature yesterday came out uh, which showed that you could actually use methane as a fuel, or bacteria could use methane as a fuel by using, and it's incredible this, actually. Uh, unfortunately, of course, we all get worried when we're not getting quoted. But it says uh, nitric oxide is, is the key to that. And, of course, there it is. I mean, we, we, we have actually said this. That but it has shaken me up a bit because now I think, well, maybe methane, even methane might have been an early fuel. and We haven't thought about it, and then it's just a bit of a shock. But anyway, uh, so yes, uh, it's a large part of productivity on the planet by Archaea is to make methane. It's a major aspect of life. It's, it's, a not a bacteria, so how it's an Archaea. It's effectively like a bacteria, and except it has a completely different membrane. It has a lot of things that are rather different, but it does have the same kind of, gen the way it makes its genes is the same. But everything else, almost everything else is different. It's got to do with DNA and Oh yeah, it's got, yeah. Uh, all, it's got all the genetic systems. That's why we know there's only one universal common ancestor, effectively, but we say it kind of splits off into these two immediately on escape from the mound. Maybe you should draw the Uh, well, I, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> my back is turned. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's a bit heavy with the English jokes, you know. Okay, so what actually happens is that. Uh, this, well, let me get this right. So there's an arc here, okay, and that makes methane. Uh, and it needs a bacterium, and I hope I get this right. The bacterium can do the CO2 and, and, and can generate hydrogen, that's right, can generate hydrogen. Okay, and eventually, I think it's the other way around, isn't it? Let me get this right, sorry. So there's, there's a little bacterium that generates H2, and there's an archaea might make something like methane, and the archaea needs the hydrogen and the CO2, and it can get the hydrogen, instead of getting it from a hydrothermal vent, it can get it from a bacterium that can, we've actually seen one on, on the slide here, that actually can make hydrogen from, shall we say, uh, formic acid or actually organic molecules, makes the hydrogen, and the arch so they're in symbiotic interrelationships. And uh, eventually, what happens is they get very more, much more symbiotic until eventually the archaea takes over the bacterium. Uh, and this, this is the first eukaryote, so to speak. This, be this becomes, uh, this becomes actually what you would might have heard of as mitochondria. Actually, it's called a hydrogenous cell. But this is probably the earliest mitochondria. And the, and the extraordinary thing about this is something that's not actually. Uh, anything to do with oxygen to start with. It's a hydrogen provider for the archaea. And, the, and then the archaea, uh, you know, basically it takes over. So that's why uh, people tend to draw it uh, coming off from the archaea. So if that's the bacteria and that's the archaea, people tend to draw the uh, eukaryotes, which is us and the trees, uh, coming off like that. But actually, uh, it's really through... It's really, they get together. It's a symbiosis of, of a particular kind of archaea. So you can draw the tree more like this. And, and here, you get the two together, and that becomes a eukaryote. So it's a, it's a symbiosis, a hybridization. And it only happened once. 
There's been about six symbolic events uh, to, to make things like, uh, so you have chloroplasts, for example, which are the, basically, they're the cyanobacteria that get in here. This is a mitochondrian example. But the, the chloroplasts probably came in, well, had to have come in later, so you put a chloroplast in here, which basically is a cyanobacteria. And I think you can do three more times, but each one seems to only happen once. So it happened. So yeah, you get a hydrogenous zone, but you never did that again. And then you get a, a chloroplast, but you never did that again. And I'm running out of knowledge but after that. But you're right, there's about six of them. But it's, it's rather intriguing that life seems to just do this once, each once. And I think each time only once. And I think it's because you, once it's been worked out, then the incumbents take over and nothing else gets a chance. Because as soon as it looks juicy, it gets eaten by the incumbents. A bacterium, and a bacterium that generates yeah, hydrogen. Where's the arrow? The arrow. Oh, sorry. The arrows have CO2. I guess that's so. For example, that could be CO2, uh, and this, or in fact, it can be organic molecules, and this would be hydrogen. So it's so. In fact, this is how I started working with somebody called Bill Martin, who's a in Dusseldorf, and uh, my uh, our idea, as you know, was that here's hydrogen coming in. Uh, interacting with CO2, that's what I've been talking about all afternoon. Uh, and he published this paper called the hydrogenous zone. Well, he called it the hydrogen hypothesis, and he thought that hydrogen's not hydrogenous zone is not mitochondrial when it burns things. But I wrote to him, and he wrote back uh, immediately, and, and and we started working together because I was just saying, look, not only did hydrogen was right there at the beginning of the eukaryotes, but it was right here at the, at the origin of life. So that's how we. Got, uh, working together. Uh, yes, it's just a last question. question. Uh, yes. Uh, someone really excluded the scenario you have depicted of all the afternoon is not still existing now, right? Uh, well, it's come back to the incumbent problem. But, uh, the, problem? Like the incumbent problem. That is that the problem that once you've got. It's, it, this is the kind of thing that happens at universities. This, you know, they try and, I mean, let me give you a warning if you're not aware of this, you know, but if they decide to amalgamate two departments in one university, then I pity the people who've come from the other university because the incumbents have control, okay? So that's the way the world works. Uh, and when it works in all kinds of areas, as you know, but uh, so my argument is that once you've got something that can use the energy and generate entropy, anything, any upstarts have had it. Because as soon as they get interesting, they're eaten. Yeah, but uh, assume that somehow by the reverse, by the quick timing of alternative, oh, I see. some new environment is created, which is cardiogenic. In fact. Yes, it may be, but of course the bacteria, they could, they've kind of got legs now, or at least they've got these spindles that can take them there. So uh, they're immediately invaded, I'd say, by, by extant life. And also, of course, not only that, but... It's, it's hard to repeat those early Earth conditions because the Earth now is so compromised by life. And so, and, and, oh, yeah. I mean, for example, you know, in, when you look at the early Earth, you might have been able to count, and I'm guessing here, something like 10 minerals on the Earth. Now there's 4,000 minerals, and the 4,000 minerals are there because of life. It's really made all the difference. <clears throat> you made an interesting remark in that you said that it sounded like the, you were saying there were, there was evidence in the Luca uh, for, for for some of the um, colored enzymes that uh, would be that you would be uh, hypothesizing to exist. Can you explain well, that again? Uh, in that case, I'm working with somebody called Wolfgang Nitschke, who is. Uh, did his PhD at Regensburg, but he works in France in Marseille, at CNRS Marseille. We work together. And uh, what he's done is the genetics, the genetics of these uh, proteins. And he can show whether they are uh, due to gene swapping, which is one of the things that happens is there's gene swapping, of course, uh, which is kind of not the same as this hybridization. But if these, so for example, the archaea learn how to, to make sulfate to reduce sulfate. Okay, so the archaea learn how to do this. The bacteria didn't. They learn how to make it into eventually into H2S. So they could do that. But 
we need some energy to, to do this. And but once they got the gene, then that gene was swapped or taken in by the local bacteria. So, so that's gene swapping. But with these particular enzymes, he can trace the fact that they both go down to the common ancestor. And now, I think nearly every methyloenzyme, except the sulfate one, goes down to the, to the last gene that's a common ancestor. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So, from the lipid number where you are for the organs to go, how did they acquire the lipid number? Uh, well, that's a great one. I wish I hadn't changed the slide now, but. Uh, so why would bacteria and archaea have different membranes? I mean, that is really weird. Once life gets a, a kind of good trick for something, it doesn't like to give it up. So one quick way of answering that is to say it's because there weren't, they didn't have lipid membranes. That in fact, the, lipid, the lipids to the membranes was, in, was invented after the last universal common ancestor. And we kind of really stick to that. Because we, we say that the first membranes are likely to be peptidic. Or pep, I mean, uh, even the cell walls now are peptoglycan. They have a lot of peptides involved. So I think, and when you think about the actual uh, jobs done on the membrane, the jobs are all done by protein. You know, the lipid is merely the plastic bag, so to speak, to keep out the protons so they go in the right place. So, uh, so we'd say, yes, they're, they're invented afterwards, and they've certainly got a different... Uh, generation that doesn't look as though it goes back to the last universal common ancestor. And that is very disappointing to many people working on lipids, especially those people that think life started with a lipid shell. Uh, so of course, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm saying it's unpopular, and then we haven't proven the point either. But that, I don't know if that goes some way to answer it. In a quick lull, I just want to point out one thing. But, so this was the mound. And I just want to emphasize that it's very unlikely that any bacterium or archaea blown out of there, of which, of course, they would get blown out by the hydrothermal system, would survive. This is a desert. I mean, it's, not a, it's a desert, and it's a very rough desert. To our mind, what actually happened was that the, the next, the, the takeover, the, the, the way out of the mound was down into the, what's called the deep biosphere. And that the way that early Earth was populated was, again, by the convection or advection of the ocean floor. And eventually, uh, and I'm jumping way ahead, but it's got one interesting point about that. You can get, some of them are taken to the surface. They worked out defenses against solar energy. And using a calcium manganese complex, CAMN408, uh, uh, they, they, managed how to, they managed to split uh, oxygen and hydrogen. So what, what, I mean, what did the bacteria want? Remember I started with two protons and two electrons. Oxygen in photosynthesis gives you four protons and four electrons, electrons from two waters. And oxygen, of course, is their waste gas, of which we eat. Uh, it's interesting, we name the major structures of the Earth that are living are after the, uh, whatever the effluent is. So we've got the acetogens making acetate, the methanogens making methane, and we've got the oxygen evolving complex, that is the waste product from oxygenic photosynthesis. And just out of interest, this is very much like a mineral. So it looks as though what happened was a bacteria managed to get a mineral, a little mineral cluster stuck to it on the outside. Uh, it was impacted with solar energy. It found that it could get some hydrogen that way, and eventually it was invaginated into the cell. And, but still, to this day, it looks just like a mineral. So there's another example of the significance of a particular structure, mineral structure, being all important for energetics, uh, for a new process that is continuous to this day. I mean, same for... What, 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 what is it? Oh, that's cyanobacteria. Sorry. Yeah. So what I mean, the interesting thing is that you know, it's a calcium manganese complex. So, uh, so I mean, it is, it, and it, it can form a cubane if it were all manganese. But a cubane for something like this would be bad news because if you're trying to get four electrons and four protons going, you don't want something locked in a cube. You want something that can do this, more like a butterfly. And we could say that well, the reason for this is that. You can't get a mineral cubane structure like regite. You can't do that if you've got calcium. There is no such mineral. But if you have, if that were all manganese, then you can have a mineral called hausmanite, which gets locked. So, so again, even there, I think mineralogy is helpful to understand biochemistry. Okay, 
thinking that this entire deep biosphere was really discovered only maybe in the just last 10 years or something, yeah. or a little bit more than that, is there could be much more out there than that has really not been discovered yet. So what is the scope for finding? Well, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think some people say at least 50% of life is happening down here. But on the other hand, the conditions are fairly restricted. Uh, very much like this. So hydrogen is coming up, sulfate is coming down, carbon dioxide is here. So in fact, there is not much use for evolution here. I mean, once you, so yeah. the methanogens, you know, mostly this is methanogens. A lot of them are methanogens here. Uh, and this, you know, they've probably been like that for four billion years. But the but evolution ha happens up here. But the the interaction between the different, I mean, if there were different life forms, uh, they would have not been able to interact that very much. So but they do. They make the, and the incredible thing is they make these things called biofilms, and they don't, in a way, they don't care who their neighbor is. They can, they, they all get together to make the same biofilm. And indeed, a recent paper in Nature showing that when a particular poison comes in, some bacteria behave altruistically and die <coughs> uh, to generate what's required for the system. And it, you know, it, it, it's really extraordinary. But I mean, to talk about evolution is much better, I think, to be on either in the sea or on dry land, and I'm sure you all know this, but why is it that uh, the trees and so forth and, and all the plants out there have so many more genes than we do? Indeed, why can we, why can we appeal to the plants for drugs? I mean, why can we do that? And the reason is because they can't run. So they've got to have all their defenses all the time, whereas we've got legs, we can get away from danger. Uh, so there's, there's another, that would be another drive for evolution. And of course, as soon as we can do this, then we can drop all kinds of genes that we don't need, uh, because they're all energy requirements. Any other questions? If that's not the case, then we uh, remind you that we have some beer out here, but let's thank Mike, first of all. <laughs> Tiring to you because you have to keep talking to them.